I'm not sure uh, whether I'm going to uh, present a further variation of uh, David Scully's theme, um, but I certainly uh, do share some, some underlying basic ideas, such as uh, the claim that we can identify a body of societal constitutionalism beyond the nation state, and that is not simply reducible to the national or to the international order, and that does not originate from interstate actions. In contrast to state-centric interpretations who systematically ignore or downplay the genuine societal aspects of processes of constitution making, my claim is that the theory of constitutionalism suitable for the global age needs to take the form of a microsociological analysis. Therefore, I qualify the origins of constitutionalism neither in abstract legal, philosophical, or in mere political sense, but in genuine sociological terms. From this sociological point of view, what can be observed is the evolution of constitutional frameworks within specific social fields. Gunter Teubner has introduced them, of course, such, in the, such as in the economy, science, environment, health, sports, and so forth, which gradually free themselves from their reliance on territorial stabilization mechanisms of the nation state. By now, quite accepted illustrated, um, illustrations of these constitutional structures are, the, are in the sector of transnational commercial law, as Gunter Teubner has already introduced, Lex Mercatoria, in the realm of the internet, the so-called Lex Digitalis, and in the sphere of the sport, the so-called Lex Sportiva. Yet, the manifestations of these quasi-autonomous legal regimes evolve neither with the goal-oriented intention to destroy the state's authority and legitimacy, nor are they simply a result of a certain economic power. At the contrary, they are the result of the tremendous social need of self-governance and self-regulations of these social fields, since the state and its policy and lawmaking apparatus no longer supply adequate responses to the increasing demand of normative expectations on the transnational level. Yet it follows from the above that the theory of constitutionalism, which is capable to analyze not only state constitutionalism, but also these new forms of living constitutions, has become the, the central challenge for present constitutional thought. To substantiate my argument, I would like to suggest that societal constitutionalism in globalization is generated through complex cultural and structural interactions induced by multiple actors on national, international and transnational level, which are positioned at different points in the global political arena and which produce social and legal norms through and across state territorial institutions and jurisdictional boundaries. Therefore, I argue that it is necessary to abstract the core concept of constitutionalism from its historical contingencies and in particular from modern political system and the state apparatus. This does not mean that the state and its constitution is about to disappear. That is, of course, not the case. But it does mean that the territorial frame of the international system of several nation states, which has emerged in the modern era and went global after 1945, is today overshadowed by a plurality of constitutional structures generated by a variety of non-state actors. Therefore, an adequate understanding of constitutionalism in times of past national consolations, to use a coin of Habermas, must be developed upon the basis of a general theory of globalization, which is capable of describing this transformation from a territorial state configuration of the world to a multi-dimensional structure of world society. In the, in the following, I will present a genuine sociological interpretation which tries to transcend the methodological nationalism of traditional constitutional thinking. In mm. order to explain my thoughts, I will advance my object in three steps. In the first step, I wish to unfold my point by presenting a theory of globalization as developed by the neo-institutional approach of John W. Mayer and his colleagues at Stanford University. Based on that neo-institutional conception, I will then illustrate in a second step my arguments by using the example of the global diffusion of the normative concept of transitional justice in the context of the activities of civil society organizations, experts, um, communities, and, net and advocacy networks, um, 
in the global field of dealing with the past. The normative concept of transitional justice, as I understand it, represents a recently developed global framework of legal and social norms that counts as tools to foster post-conflict justice and both enable democratic institution building as well as reconfigurations of domestic, legal and constitutional systems according to international law in any specific post-conflict society in the world. My aim is to demonstrate how this hybrid legal concept has emerged and to describe its evolution to a global constitutional structure in world society. Finally, in the third step, I will summarize my arguments and conclude my presentation with some thoughts that might inspire future research in the field of transnational constitutionalism. So I come to, to the neo-institutional approach now. Um, since the 1970s, Various sociological approaches have tried to understand the global, yet only a few of them have systematically, systematically addressed the global as a social sphere of its own right. The most prominent examples are the world system analysis and, as introduced by Peter Heinz and Immanuel Wallerstein, the theory of reflexive modernity as developed by Anthony Giddings and Ulrich Beck, and the world society theory as conceptualized by Niklas Luhrmann and um, Rudolf, Rudolf Stichwe, and the sociology of world polity and world culture as developed by John W. Mayer and his research team at Stanford University. Despite their differences and in thematic perspective and theoretical designs, what these schools of research have in common is the fact that their analytical focus lies on the global level rather than the individual nation state. Mayer and his colleagues argue in their work, which, was, which will be the focal point of, of my presentation, that world society has already taken shape and developed as an independent level of reality for a structural horizon of reference for all social processes. This sphere of reality as an irreducible context of reality not only determines subordinate social levels, in fact, these entities are indeed constituted as a result of the consolidation of world society. With this basic idea that societal developments are subject to a microstructure of structuration, Mayer and his con colleagues on the one hand contradict traditional theories of society that perceive individuals, communities or social groups as the analytical antipode to society. On the other hand, the neo-institutional approach does not simply equate society with organizations nor does it reduce society to operatively closed social systems. Rather than viewing organizations or social systems as the primary cause of the dynamics of structural formation in society, Mayer and his theoretical camp see them as the result of these dynamics since they are embedded in a wider sociocultural process, which in turn has, has impact on the formation of structures in specific social fields, such as the economy, science, politics, and law. Whereas classical theories on sociology, from Weber till Bourdieu, qualify the formation of social orders are derived from specific human or social needs, Mayer and his followers avoid anthropological categories completely and instead postulate that structures of order take shape as a result of their own inner dynamics through processes of routinization and habitualization. In the, this view, the reproduction of the social is not driven by conscious calculations, the enhancement of economic or political rationalities, or the internalization of values and norms, but rather by taking for granted assumptions about knowledge and rationality that accompanies them, which in turn shape social and normative expectations and legitimate behavior. From this point of view, from this strict constructivist epistemology, the question concerning the origins and modes of social societal constitutionalism in globalization appears in a new light, one that is relevant much more to the overarching macrostructure of world society as it is to the domestic level of nation state politics or simple international relations. If we further follow John W. Mayer's constructivist sociology of globalization, then the neo-institutional perspectives yields 
the following interpretation. The dominant world culture in terms of a Durkheimian social fact generates a comprehensive matrix of constitu constitutive principles that define the ontological value of actors and their actions. From this point of view, nation states are not, as conventional soci sociological theories would assume, naturally given entities, but rather enactments of a superior world culture. These macro structure features definitions for legitimate actorhood, such as sovereign nation states, formal organizations, and single individuals, and includes schemes for their rational behavior. Yet, in striving to be recognized within world society as a legitimate actor, single nation states are virtually forced to meet the cultural roles of modern actorhood and to adopt global institutional patterns despite the fact that they contravene the state's own political motives and conventions and in contra contra contradictions to their own canon of cultural and religious values. As scripted actors, states unavoidably follow the script of world, world culture even without their explicit consent, which forces them to adapt global standards, norms, and institutions, but also creates pressure to join international organizations and to integrate them into a dense network of international treaties to safeguard human rights and other areas of political and economic policymaking. Thus, with respect to the ranges of action and options available to single nation states, both in relation to other states' actors and in relation to its own population, there's quite little room for ideas and critic experiments if the respective government wants to avoid being <coughs> enmeshed in contradictory self-descriptions and justifications. Due to the moral normative pressure brought to bear by the global public and global media, which simultaneously initiates structural similar similarities among nation states and demands a process of harmonization with global norms, states can no longer continue to follow their own course. They must meet the standards of a globally accepted, that is to say, legitimate mode of behavior. In this reading, the object to incorporate international norms, standards, and institutions into the domestic, political, legal, and constitutional systems is a direct response to the pressure, at least to simulate, to the outside modern statehood. This reinforces both the global level of world society and the individual level of the nation state. While mainstream theories of globalization perceive processes of globalization primarily in economical terms as a process that weakens or even abolishes the nation state, the neo-institutional approach argues that individual states and the emergence of world society mutually enhance each other. Implementing external structures and world cultural norms on the domestic level confirms the status of a dominant world culture and the global structural principle of state sovereignty at the same time. This process of mutual enhancement had led to the emergence of, a novel, of novel forms of law and politics on, a, on the transnational level. While the vast majority of existing works assume that the concept of law and the political in the age of globalization remains basically unchanged, the neo-institutional approach claim that new forms of cognit cognitivized law and learning-oriented processes of the political have become predominant in world society. In addition, the infrastructure upon, within, upon which these new types of law and the political relies is fundamentally different. The world cultural form of the political relies on non-state actors rather than on the concept of the nation state. That means it relies on the constitutive role of international organizations and other forces in the making of world culture, such as civil society movements, non-governmental organizations, expert communities, advocacy networks, and so forth, which are defined by Mayer as the so-called rationalized others. It further relies on a concept of knowledge-based authority rather than a concept of state authority and a concept of moral legitimacy acquired through expertise, reputation, and, prob and problem-solving capacity rather than popular sovereignty. So if we take the evolution of the normative concept of transitional justice as a case study, and if we further follow Mayer's basic theoretical assumption, that is, 
that globality is not seen as a goal-oriented outcome of specific actors or social fields such as the economy, politics or transnational um, operating companies, but rather as a direct result of an institutional environment in which these actors are socially constructed, then the following interpretation of societal constitutionalism in globalization emerge. The creation, diffusion, and adoption of new global norms occurs within an increasingly dense transnational social field in which various actors of politics of dealing with the past appear as creators and disseminators of specific norms, standards, and institutions of transitional justice. This multidimensional, constantly self-reinforcing social networks includes the following. First, international organizations that have the authority to, to propagate prescriptive models of action for nation states and provide global public arenas in which states achieve legitimacy by complying with world cultural models of behavior. In particular, the United Nations has become a very significant global actor since it declares law principles of state sovereignty as well as universal human rights as institutionalized world cultural ideals. Therewith, it also creates possibilities to articulate the experience of the abuse of these universal principles, for example, in that by enabling normative claims against state abuses before local, as well as regional and international courts of justice. This goes along with the emergence of a global human rights regime, regime in which human rights work strengthens both individual and collective factors underlining the enforcement of individual demands for state accountability as well as the recognition and compensation of victims of past state abuses as a globally accepted legitimate concern. Second, non-governmental organization, epistemic communities and um, advocacy networks which are defined by Meyer and his colleagues as the so-called rationalized others. They are seen as the key driving force behind the global diffusion of world cultural patterns and they are participating in both the creation, global proliferation and the local implementation of world cultural norms and models of behavior. By diffusing discourses on human rights and transitional justice, they connect governmental international organizations such, such as the United Nations with local civil society movements, transnational expert communities and advocacy networks. Within this increasingly dense social context, a normative frame of reference evolves that serves simultaneously as a starting point for modern actorhood through which local as well as transnational non-state actors and civil society groups became authorized and legitimate agents and as a stage for justification of their actions as promoters of human rights and experts in the field of working through the past. In fact, since the early 1990s, there has been a dynamic accum accumulation, standardization and increasing institutionalization of the specific expertise of how to deal with systematic state added human rights violations after periods of radical political change in past conflict societies. One of the most prominent examples of this special expertise in the field of work, working, of dealing with a, with a violent past, is the, is the non-governmental organization International Center for Transitional Justice, which has its, its headquarters in New York, but also maintains regional offices in Europe, Latin America, Asia, Africa, in the Maghreb region and in the Near East. Um, established in March 2001, the NGO has accompanied and directed political transitions in over 50 countries world worldwide and collaborated in creating, establishing and implementing ad hoc international tribunals, truth and reconciliation commissions and other instruments of transitional justice such as restorative and restitutive mechanisms like commissions of inquiry, illustration policies, reparation programs and memorials in post-conflict societies around the globe. Furthermore, the NGO and 
other related organization working in the field of post-conflict justice were involved in the institutionalization of numerous international criminal courts, including, for example, the International Extraordinary Tribunal for Cambodia, East Timor, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. Following the massive waves of domestic violence, these bodies were institutionalized to seek recognition for victims by bringing perpetrators to justice in order to promote peace, reconciliation, and democratic institution building. Other post-conflict, post-authoritarian, and post-dictatorial societies, such as Argentina, after the end of the military dictatorship, South Africa, after the end of the apartheid regime, and Morocco, after the end of the so-called years of lead, used truth and reconciliation commission to deal with their respective violent past. Such commissions have also been established in states in transition facing a history of repressive rule like South Korea, the Solomon Islands, El Salvador, Ghana, the Fiji Islands, and currently in Tunisia. The general goal of transitional justice tools, be it perpetrator-oriented ad hoc international criminal tribunals or victims-oriented restorative and restitutive mechanism, is to overcome and to restructure the former suppressive state by contributing to politics of human rights and processes of restructuring domestic law and politics according to norms and values of the international legal system. The members of the um, NGO International Center for Transitional Justice make their special <coughs> expertise in dealing with large-scale past human rights <coughs> abuses and state building after political transition available not only to protest groups and um, national state bodies, but also to international organizations such as the European Union and the World Bank. They also advise diplomats and legal scholars in matters of the judici judicialization and tribalization, as well as research organizations and activists on the work of documenting human rights violations and in preparing and using databases and archives. They provide information and save survey methods and techniques for interviewing victims and train people for working with witnesses and help establish witness protection program. The staff for the NGO also offers advice on conducting public hearings and contribute to developing programs to provide restitution and compensation for victims. Their work now also includes consultation on the creation of memorial sites and on formulating and implementing recommendations for political and legal and constitutional reforms after the respective transitional justice instrument has completed their work. The accumulation and global dissemination of this specific problem-solving expertise in the field of dealing with past systematic human rights violations has been reflected in a series of international conferences, guidelines and resolutions of the United Nations on the normative concept of transitional justice, which even led to the decision of the United Nations to declare the year 2009 the International Year of Reconciliation and Transitional Justice. In fact, transitional justice is now viewed as a key element of the UN toolbox for dealing with post-conflict issues, so that the UN Department of Peacekeeping has established a new secur sec security sector reform and transitional justice unit. In the last two decades, international donors such as the World Bank and the IMF are increasingly acknowledging these policies of dealing with past human rights violations by, for example, granting public se sector loans and supporting economic development in dependence on specific transitional justice policies. Not least, to these redefined lending conditions and standards of development aid of international donors, dealing with past human rights violations has become a global model for, uh, for action in world society <coughs> that had taken the transitional justice model from its, be from its beginnings after the Nuremberg trials as a normative, uh, um, ex um, norm normative exception to its present status as a global political rule. As a result of the formation of this increasingly dense transnational context know-how transmission in the field of post-conflict justice, a global political arena, arena with the following characteristic has emerged. First, institutionalized normative expectations, such as the obligation to investigate past state-edited human rights violations and the so-called victim's right to truth. <coughs> Second, 
behavioral routines, such as victim-oriented processes of truth-seeking, reparation, and reconciliation. And thirdly, standardized criminal justice institutions, such as truth and reconciliation commissions, and special international tribunals, including hybrid tribunals. The establishment of the International Criminal Court in the year 2002, an independent supranational judicial body that is prosecuting state edit and individual crimes, genocide and crimes against humanity, represents so far the ultimate culmination of this ongoing process of global proliferation and increasing consolidation of the normative concept of transitional justice through a global legal structure. To come to a conclusion. <laughs> My aim was to demonstrate that constitutional phenomena in globalization emerge through the activities of social actors beyond the state moving quite freely um, between the national, international and transnational arena. In contrast to state-centric views who systematically ignore, downplay the social and cultural aspects of constitutional making in world society and thereby fail to recognize that a context adequate social theory of globalization also is needed to be developed, I qualify the origin of societal constitutionalism in globalization neither in abstract legalistic nor in political sense, but in generally sociological terms. In the first part of my paper, I presented the basic assumptions of the world cultural approach. From this strict constructivist perspective, actors such as nation states, organizations and single individuals are not seen as natural given social entities, but rather as a direct result of an institutional environment in which these actors are socially constructed. In this regard, the constitutive role of international organizations and other forces in making of the world culture, such as non-governmental ex organizations, experts, communities, and advocacy networks, is, as, is of great importance since these actors are seen as the pivotal creators and diffusers of world cultural models of behavior. I try to validate this neo-institutional assumption by using the example of the global proliferation of the normative concept of transitional justice in the context of the activities of several actors in this field of dealing with the past. As described in my presentation, the hybrid legal concept of transitional justice unfolded mainly as an effect of the world cultural activities of non-state actors, expert communities and advocacy networks and not as would be the case, as, it was, as would be the conventional understanding, as a willful act of non-state actors or of state actors or international agreements. By referring to global cultural norms and legitimate patterns of behavior based on the authority of international organizations such as the United Nations and supranational operating judicial bodies such as the International Criminal Court, these actors intervene into national political systems and with respect to the domestic legal and constitutional cultures forces them to a process of reconfiguration that can, that can hardly be revoked. In this regard, these constitutive forces of world society generate only a defensive form of societal constitutionalism since their interventions in transitional context relies on a rather weak concept of knowledge-based authority rather than a strong concept of state authority and a concept of moral legitimacy acquired through expertise, reputation and problem solving rather than popular sovereignty. From a neo-institutional perspective, it is therefore possible to assume that although transitional justice tools are superficially labeled as instruments for coping with the past and ensuring reconciliation, transitional justice tools thus in fact fulfills a transformational function within world society as mechanisms for adapting domestic, political, legal and constitutional conditions to global patterns of world society. As part of a general process of dissemination of patterns of behavior and normative patterns of expectations which simultaneously overlays the dominant functional differentiation structure of world society and the international political system of nation states, 
transition justice tools can therefore be described as transcultural transformers. One should take care not to overestimate this evolutionary potential of their broad sociological effect, but we should also not make the mistake of, mis of underestimating them. Thank you very much for your kind attention.